Amen. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you this morning here at Pacific Community Church, uh, a place where we are pressing in on Jesus Christ, uh, a place where we are focusing our hearts and our minds and our souls upon Jesus, who he is and what he is doing, a place where we believe in intimacy with God himself, and we believe in love of one another. And we also believe that through this intimacy with God and love with one another, the Lord will use us to impact his world. Now, that's our vision here at Pacific Community Church, intimacy and impact. So when we are here and we're worshiping God in song and we are singing about how we love him and how beautiful he is, beautiful one I love, we are singing that because of the intimacy that God has created between us and him when we were born again when we became that new creation in Christ. That's what's going on in Ephesians. That's what's happening when Paul is talking about the one that he loves. It is Jesus. He is our focus. And this book of Ephesians that we're looking at together has been leading us towards an understanding of what it means to live in a broken world or a shifting world, and yet at the same time be able to actually live with this kind of impact that God has for us to do. And it's not an easy thing. We understand that and we recognize that in the text, but it is something that's real. It was in the time of Paul and it is for the church in this day in which we live in now. I pray that that is something that you're believing or you're growing to believe that. And I hope that Ephesians is teaching us how to be like that. Let me begin uh, as we look at chapter 3 now. We've gone through chapter 1, chapter 2. Here at PCC, we work through biblical books. We go usually right through a book, and uh, sometimes we'll camp on a particular set of verses. Uh, And so in in this uh, series with Ephesians, we've looked at chapter 1, chapter 2. We're now in chapter 3, and let me start with an illustration. When I was at Bible school at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, I had a friend there whose name is Christian Barbosa. Isn't that a wonderful name? Don't you want to say it? Christian Barbosa? Let's try it. One, two, three. Christian Barbosa. Wonderful. We're very interactive here at PCC, and I've always loved that. And Christian Barbosa is a wonderful man. He's from Romania. Uh, When I met him, we were both uh, young adults. We were just 19 years old coming to this great big city of Chicago, him coming from Romania, coming from communist Romania. Yes, this was before the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, before the fall of communism in those countries. That's how old I am. And Christian Barbosa was coming with a wonderful testimony. He was a born-again Christian, but listen, he grew up under a communist regime where Christianity and atheism was promoted. Christianity was something that was being dissected out of the culture. It was something that was being oppressed, right? So he grew up under that. He didn't know Jesus. And he became a border guard for this communist government. And as a border guard, he was trained. When people come, you're to search them, search their cars at the border, and here's the things that you're to look for. Two things, he said. You're to look for guns, and he understood that. He, of course, is to look for guns. Guns can kill people, and so we want to make sure nobody's bringing guns into Romania. And here's the second thing. Look for Bibles. Make sure nobody is smuggling in any Bibles. And, you know, he thought to himself, that doesn't make sense. I, I understand the guns, but I don't understand Bibles. He didn't know anything about the Bible, But he thought, why is this government teaching me to not bring, not allow Bibles to come into the country? Well, he went on to say, this is the reason that he discovered. He discovered that the gospel is about how God brings life where it was otherwise impossible. Uh, Christian Barbosa, when he was learning about how to search for guns and Bibles, decided Maybe I should look into this Bible to find out why we want to restrict it from coming into Romania. And so he went on an investigation, and I was able to get a Bible. And when he opened up the Word of God, have you heard stories like this from me before or from others? When he opened up the Word of God, there he found the living God who desires to have a relationship with him. And through reading the Scriptures, he gave his life to Jesus, and he became a new creation in Christ. Amen. That's how he learned that the gospel is about how God brings life 
where it was otherwise impossible. That's been his testimony for many years, and I heard his testimony uh, when we were both together there in Chicago. That government knew that if you let in the Bible, you're going to be letting in Jesus Christ. Through his word, people are going to find out that there is freedom in believing in Jesus Christ. There is freedom. That's an important reality, and it's a very important illustration to understand what's going on in Ephesians 3. And so I want us to look at that together this morning. Here's that quote for you from Christian Barbosa. The gospel is about how God brings life where it was otherwise impossible. That's certainly what's happening here in the context for the Apostle Paul. And you remember from last week, if you were able to be here, that we looked at how the Apostle Paul was teaching there used to be barriers for the Gentiles to get into the holy place. And really, there were barriers set up all around worshiping God in this holy of holies. You couldn't get past this barrier into the, from this court of the Gentiles into the place where the Israelites were allowed to go. And only women were allowed in this section. And only Israelite men were allowed in these sections over here. And only the priests in this area. And then only the priests inside this holy place. And only the high priest once a year in Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies. All of these barriers, Paul said, have actually been brought down. They've all been destroyed, these barriers. Or the curtain has been ripped. Yes, isn't that beautiful? What a, what a creation I've made there. It's a bit of a mess, actually. And it's all been destroyed or it's all been brought down through the blood of Jesus Christ. These barriers have been removed. Now, this uh, removal of the barriers is something that he was teaching in Ephesus. And so the context for this gospel equals life message is really a context in which Paul himself, having gone to Ephesus and having preached the good news, saw many people convert to Jesus Christ and to believe into him. And so one day, Paul, with one of the Gentiles uh, who had become a Christian, Uh, in Ephesus, they sailed down to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, Paul started to preach this good news message about the barriers coming down. Well, he was accused of bringing a Gentile, this person that had come with him from Ephesus, past the barrier into the temple place. And it wasn't true, but it was true that he was preaching that wasn't he? He was preaching good news through Jesus Christ. By his blood, we've been brought into that holy place. Well, there was a mob. There was a a terrible attack against Paul, and he was arrested, and he was taken to uh, Caesarea Philippi right here on the coast, and he was in prison for two years there in that city of Caesarea Philippi, two years suffering as a prisoner And then after two years, he finally appealed to Caesar because he knew that this was going nowhere. He was going to be there for the rest of his life. So he appealed to Caesar and then eventually was put onto a boat as a prisoner, chained, and he was taken by ship. And it was a stormy journey. And they went along this way. Fair Havens is there. And they kept going against Paul's advice. And there were storms of all kinds. Along here, the stormy weather, and eventually they were shipwrecked on Malta. And then uh, after shipwreck and snake bites and Paul alive, imagine this, what, prisoner, two years, prison's journey, I don't know what that means, and then still going forward and coming here to, uh, to this area and then eventually here to Rome, the city of Rome, where Paul was a prisoner again for another Two years, and Paul every day was chained, and he had a Roman guard there under house arrest in Rome. And this context is what's going on when Paul literally, when he writes Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, where he says this, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. Um, did you say, you meant to say Caesar, didn't you? Uh, sorry. I think you made a mistake there, you know, this is an English accent there, but a prisoner of Jesus. What do you mean by that? No, he meant a prisoner of Jesus Christ. This is a very important phrase. 
It's a very important thing to understand. He did not make a mistake when he said this. Paul, with that kind of context going on, is saying that he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What does he mean? Well, it is far too simple to just say, well, he's a prisoner because of Jesus. We might initially go there and say, well, it's because he's been preaching the good news. He got arrested. That's why he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ in that sense. I mean, that's not wrong, but there's so much more that is going on with this phrase. So much more that he's unpacking already in Ephesians and he's going to unpack in chapter 3. What does he mean? Well, first of all, he means when it comes to being a prisoner that Jesus is the one who holds the key. As a prisoner, he knows that Jesus holds the key. Listen, he holds the key, Paul knows, to the physical chains that he is enduring. Yes, the actual shackles that are upon him, he knows that Jesus holds the key even for those. He knows this because when he was on his second missionary journey, he was arrested for inciting a riot and a mob, and he was put into a jail in Philippi. And there in jail, there was suddenly an earthquake. And when this earthquake shook the jail cells, the doors opened. And Paul was able to go out and to be free. And you remember the jailer thought, oh no, all the prisoners have escaped. I'm going to have to kill myself because this is terrible what's happened. Paul was able to say, no, you know, we're here. Don't worry. Don't do this. And that jailer became a born-again Christian. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's that's the the verse in the book of Acts. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So Paul certainly knows that the actual chains to which he is bound there for two years in Caesarea Philippi, two years in Rome, and the chains that were upon him as he traveled to that place from Caesarea to Rome, he knows that even God holds the keys to those things, those physical realities. He also knows that Jesus holds The real chains, those invisible chains, those chains that are on our hearts, the chains that are on our souls. He knows that Jesus holds the key to unlock the chains of sin upon humanity. And those chains are so serious that the scriptures teach us the chains lead us to a place called spiritual death. And the only way to have those chains unlocked is through faith in Jesus. The world needs to hear this. The world needs to hear the good news about being released or being given freedom through faith in Jesus Christ. The sin and death that holds us fast needs to be released by listening to Paul's words to the jailer in Philippi. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So yes, those invisible chains of sin and death, as well, we can, even as born-again Christians who have been released from that because of our faith in Jesus, we can be in a prison of sorts in our life. We can get stuck in our life or get chained up. Our soul, our heart can become like this. Sometimes when our circumstances, and this is the point here that we're getting to, sometimes when our circumstances are difficult, Our hearts end up in a prison of sorts. And so we need the book of Ephesians. We need the Lord to teach us that even though Paul was experiencing this kind of trouble, this kind of shifting world, this kind of tragedy of being a prisoner, he knew that even those circumstances, Jesus held the key to living with freedom, even in the midst of that. Paul is saved. Jesus is the key. He knows it. He experienced it on the road to Damascus. Jesus is the key. Paul is a prisoner. Jesus is the key. A prisoner of Jesus, therefore, as we've looked at this first verse, means to live with freedom. Freedom from sin and living in freedom even while we may be in prison. This is called the Zoe life. Living with freedom in the midst of our shifting world and our circumstances, even if they're suffering. We can, we can actually live the Zoe life. You remember, this is something that has been a bit of a theme for me over the last number of years, preaching here at Pacific. I've been preaching and often have 
uh, been moving us towards an understanding of what it means to have Zoe life. Zoe being that Greek word uh, for freedom, uh, that Greek word that talks about how Jesus said we can have life to the full, the fullest measure of life. That's life with Jesus Christ. How will we become prisoners of Jesus Christ or how will we live as prisoners of Jesus Christ? How could you and how could I live today as a prisoner of Jesus Christ? We can, by being entirely the Lord's, we can be entirely the Lord's through faith in Jesus, knowing that he holds the key sometimes to our very real physical chains that are around us. Those may be chains that have to do with our health. They may be chains that have to do with our families. Listen, you may have come today with chains that you know are very real in your life because of something in your workplace, in your school, in your home, in your mind, in your, in your mental health, in, in your past. You bring chains with you and you drag them into the church and they rattle away as you sit down. And then you read the text and you realize that a prisoner once wrote that Jesus has the key. Be a prisoner of Jesus and you'll find freedom for those chains that bind you today. Every single one of them. As real physically as they can be and that reality of being chained in our heart, in our mind, and in our soul. Jesus is the key to release you from those things. There's another reason why we can say that uh, we are prisoners of Jesus or why Paul can say that he was a prisoner of Jesus. And this is the other reason. It's because Paul knew that as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he had a purpose. To be a prisoner of Jesus means to have a very real purpose. There's purpose in Paul's suffering. Now listen, I, I understand that it can be cliche to say as a Christian, well, <clears throat> you may be suffering, but Jesus has a purpose. And if there was no compassion or empathy in that kind of a statement, then, then that would be cliche. And if there was also no reality of what we have seen time and time again, where Jesus has shown us that it's true, that he does bring about purpose through our difficult circumstances or even our suffering. If we hadn't seen Jesus do that in our lives time and time again, then we might be just saying that as a cliche. But it's true. It's true, and we see it here in Paul's life. And, and we've seen it in our own lives as well. We testify to it. And so our why, God? Why do I experience what I'm experiencing? Why am I going through this? Why is our world going through this? Why do I keep finding these chains that you've broken off and picking them back up and clasping them back onto my life and then dragging them back into the church? Why do I keep doing that? And the answer here is literally that we may be a broken people and this may be a broken world and there's all kinds of suffering in it and God can accomplish many things in our suffering. It's not cliche. It's a reality. It gives us hope. It gives us strength. And it gives us purpose. It did for Paul. And I think his example really helps us move forward the first way in which Paul saw his suffering in chains as God's purpose was to be an ambassador. He saw himself as an ambassador in chains. In fact, in chapter 6, he is going to call himself uh, to the Ephesians an ambassador in chains. Well, how was he an ambassador in chains? Well, we know that for Paul, uh, he was surrounded by prisoners. And we know that he shared the good news with other prisoners around him. And many prisoners became followers of Jesus through his preaching there in prison. Can you imagine being a, a prisoner in the same cell in Caesarea Philippi or on the same ship as they were traveling across or the same cell when he first arrived in Rome? Uh, he was able to share the good news with others who were in that cell same circumstance of suffering. And when they heard, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, they were converted. They were, they were uh, new creations. They gave their lives to Jesus. 
So prisoners hearing the good news. A good friend of mine uh, from Northern Ireland when I was at school there, um, he shared with me that um, when he was 18 years old, he went to jail, a life sentence. And he was filled with the chains of hatred. In Northern Ireland, he'd grown up under a, a false doctrine that had filled his life with hatred. Oh, he said, I had such hatred in my heart. And he, he went to jail, and, and he was there and, and was at the lowest point a prisoner uh, could possibly be. And he said he was walking, for the first time, he was walking around in the, in the yard when he was allowed to get some exercise. And the prisoners in Northern Ireland in this place in Belfast would just do a little circle around the courtyard, and they would just walk in a circle, he said. Everybody had their heads down. Everybody was living a physical reality of what's going on inside of them. And certainly in, in the heart of my friend Gary, chained to this horrible thing called hatred, chained to it his whole life. It had manifested through his life in some of the most terrible ways. And there he was walking around and around and around. Somebody was like an Apostle Paul. And when he was going around, the person that was coming around this way beside him suddenly said, Jesus, and just kept walking. He said it in an Irish accent, but he, he said, Jesus. And my friend Gary, what, what? what? And he just kept walking. And every time this person passed the new, the new guy, uh, he said, Jesus. And my friend Gary eventually, like Christian Barbosa, like many of us, eventually thought, huh, I wonder. Yeah? He keeps saying, Jesus, I wonder. And so he went to this man when they had the opportunity, and he said, why do you keep saying Jesus? Because you may be in physical prison here, but I'm going to tell you something. You can live with Zoe life. You can live free. You don't have to be shackled to hatred anymore. You don't have to live with sin and death. You don't have to die shackled to this and find yourself in hell. Instead, you can have freedom in Jesus Christ, even while you're shackled up here in Belfast. Well, my friend Gary became a Christian. He became a born-again Christian. And like we learned in Ephesians, he became God's workmanship. He became God's masterpiece. You remember that word that we translated? He became God's masterpiece. He went from trash, throwing out into the prison, get rid of you, lock him up, put him away. And he became alive through Jesus, a masterpiece. We are his workmanship, created for good works in Christ. When I met Gary, he was uh, finally uh, freed from prison, went to Bible school so that he could become a preacher, so that he could tell others the good news. Prisoners were around Paul. They became born again. Roman guards, we know from Paul's writings to Philemon, that even the Praetorian guard, that 10,000 group of elite Roman soldiers, we're hearing the good news. Could you imagine being the prisoner that, or the guard that had to be shackled up next to Paul? Uh, the, the guard every day who had to come to Paul's house under arrest, put on, make sure his chains were on, and then had to sit there in the room while Paul preached the good news? Of course, these guards were hearing about life to the full, Zoe, life through Jesus, freedom. They were becoming Christians. And Paul writes to Philemon and says, many, even in the Praetorian Guard, have become Christians. And then he said this, even people in Caesar's household have become Christians. That happened through the Lord using the suffering circumstances of Paul. Through this, God can accomplish many things. And he accomplished the furthering of his kingdom through Paul's being a prisoner. Paul knew that though he was an ambassador in chains and living under arrest, he was also seated in heaven at the same time. So I might ask us this morning if we might also then hear that good news message from Paul as an ambassador in chains that we can have freedom in Christ. And can you share the good news in your circumstances? If Paul can share in his circumstances, you can too. And it's something that I've really encouraged us with over these years together has been that whatever the Lord has placed you in, wherever he's called you to, he's also called you to be an ambassador. He's called you to share the good news wherever you go. Paul was not only an ambassador in chains, 
And it's described here in chapter 3, verse 1, through the mystery of Christ Jesus. He is an ambassador in chains for the Gentiles, he said. And this uh, calling that he's received is to share the mystery. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. That revelation coming on the road to Damascus. The mystery being that Jesus Christ is in fact God. And that he by his death and resurrection and by faith in him will give grace to those who follow him. And they will be free. Well that mystery, that revelation uh, as he's already written briefly to them. In reading this then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets and through them to others around them. Well, finally, the purpose uh, that Paul can testify to, another reason why it's important to see ourselves as prisoners of Jesus Christ is because as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, we are called to bless others, and we can bless others. And Paul, he uh, did this, didn't he? The, the truth is that Paul had planned to go back to these cities. He had planned to go back to Ephesus and some of these other cities, but because he was now a prisoner, he was unable to do that. He was unable to go back to Ephesus. And so he wrote these letters, literally because he couldn't go. And in writing these letters down, uh, he was able to write something that has continued now for thousands of years and has been a blessing to millions of people. Think about that. Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon while he was there in Rome because he couldn't go. He was an incredible blessing to others through the reality of being a prisoner of Caesar. But because he was truly a prisoner of Jesus Christ, the Lord used him to be a blessing to others. Well, God may have a purpose for you that you don't know yet. And listen, you may not see it in your lifetime. You may not see it in your lifetime. And so I'm calling you today to what is so difficult for all of us, and I understand this. In our circumstances of of suffering or or challenges or difficulty, the, the thing that's hard to picture is that God is going to use you in this reality to bless others, and it may be a blessing that you don't even see in your lifetime. It might be something that's further down the road, like we see with Paul. My encouragement then for you today is to hold fast to that faith. Believe in that. Believe that God is using you to bless others, even as difficult or as challenging as your circumstances may be. This is what it means to be a prisoner of Jesus, to live with that kind of freedom. We must see ourselves as blessing others, including the blessing of unification. So finally, the verse that I'll finish with today is the next verse, verse 6, which says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, You remember Paul's been using different metaphors, hasn't he? A house, a building, a temple, here now a body. And we're all members of one body. And therefore, unification is critical. We're one body, all members together. The church comes together when others are in trouble. And I urge us all to remain in unity when we are facing trials of many kinds. I think that this church has been devoted to that. I really believe that Pacific, if you're new to Pacific, you must understand this is a church that's been devoted to unity, uh, even through the most difficult trials that we may have faced. And it is a shifting world, and it is a shifting culture. And so I urge us, moving forward, Pacific, be a church that continues to hold fast to this reality of being a prisoner of Jesus, which means that we are committed to unity with one another. 
Well, the story ends for the Apostle Paul, not the book of Ephesians, but it ends for the Apostle Paul when um, there was a, a fire in Rome. And it was in the middle 60s AD, and the fire uh, almost completely destroyed the city of Rome. Uh, Paul was a, a prisoner of Nero, the, the Caesar, the emperor Nero, but really we know he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ, as were many others by the time that this fire broke out. And you can see with this map that the fire areas in Rome destroyed so much of the city. All the seven hills of Rome were ablaze. This whole area was ablaze. And then Nero kind of used this opportunity to be able to look for a scapegoat and said, well, there's one place that the fire doesn't seem to have burnt. Maybe you can see it on the map there. There's an area that hasn't been burned. Out of the multiple districts of Rome, there was only a few left that were unburned. And that's where the Christians lived. And so he said, it must be their fault. And... So they turned their attention to the scapegoat being Christians. Paul, who was under arrest, was likely at this time taken as one of the ones who was uh, a Christian and was martyred. Peter, others, many others, taken and martyred for their faith in Jesus. And even though they were killed for who they believed in. We know that they lived in freedom, even under the tyranny around them, even under what they suffered. We know that they lived in freedom, the freedom of Jesus Christ to live in the now, in the now circumstances. And we know that Christians who continued to be martyred after Nero continued to show the love of Jesus Christ to the point where the city started to transform the people, the culture, the future began to transform because Christians continued to live out the Zoe life of freedom by being a prisoner of Jesus Christ instead of prisoners of the tyranny around them. And Christians kept living out this goodness and this good life, and it transformed people around them. And then when the plagues hit, it was the Christians who went forward and showed compassion and mercy and care. And when the next tyranny came and the next thing came, it was the believers who went forward as prisoners of Jesus to live out the Christ calling that he has given them. This is our call. This is our calling today. And I pray that it is something that draws you forward into intimacy with him in this day in which we live in. Let's pray together. And so, Lord, we come before you as your prisoners. Yeah, we use that because we know that one day you arrested us. Yeah. Like you arrested Paul on the road to Damascus, you have drawn us to you. And so we put our faith in you today, Jesus. We ask that you would come now, Lord, and we would have a sense of your closeness in our hearts, the living God among us, that we might even experience you now, Lord, as you are the true living God. And in that sense, Lord, that we might have a great lifting up of the freedom that you give. To be your prisoner means to live in freedom. And so I pray, Lord, for this church. I pray that you would bless us to live this free life that you have called us to. It is in your name, Lord, I pray. Amen.